What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. Now I'm recording here. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I've got a really interesting guest on the show today. His name is Raja Deer. He is a science-based entrepreneur, co-founder, and co-CEO of Seed, a science, a microbiome science company. Uh, you know, microbiome is really a topic of conversation today in, in many different verticals and arenas. Um, I am really excited to speak to Raja about microbiome. I also want to get Raja's story, of course. I also want to ask him what it's like to be a co-CEO for real, because that is definitely uh, something that I have experienced with, and I would love to compare notes. Um, but ladies and gents, welcome to the show, Raja Deer. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks, Michael. It's a pleasure. Um, so the way this podcast rolls out is I get an opportunity to speak with people that have inspired me and, and many others. You are one of those guys. I love to figure out whether or not you are born or made, meaning you were born with an inherent slash innate ability to get to where you're at today, or you were made over time. I like to get there through hearing your story from as early back as you can take us, potentially to your early childhood and, and discuss with us things that motivated you to get after it the way you are and have today. So I would love for you to introduce yourself because I'm sure it's gonna, be, it's gonna come better from you than it is for me. And uh, let's just dive right into your story, man. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, I, I think the first three years of life, it's tough to tease apart what's in it, a born trait versus what's uh, picked up in those kind of really mushy formative periods along the way. But for today, I'll just call I'll, I'll call that those first instincts that developed the born part of it. And then I, I think everything afterwards we can re refer to as made. Um, spoiler alert, I, I, I'm, I'm far on the made spectrum, but <laughs> Um, in terms of where I started, you know, there, there's definitely some, some parts of my story, I think that, that played a big role in, in, in where I am today. So, um, my, let's see my, both of my, uh, grandparents are from, uh, from my mother and father's side are from the far Northern, uh, end of India and opposite ends or ranges of, um, the base of the Himalayan mountains. And, uh, my mother's my mother actually grew up and spent the first 10 years of her life on a captain on, on, on a shipping vessel my grandfather was a captain and so they were depending on where the job was that's what country they would go, they would go to and she grew up at sea essentially um and so i think i attributed a lot of uh i think my initial curiosity or at least um understanding that global cultures are so different and 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 how your early exposure to different cultures can play a big role in what you see as limiting factors later on versus what you see as um, enabling factors later later on I think that having that perspective from a young age from from stories from my grandfather and mother really played a big role um, I was uh, my, my parents moved to the United States when my mom was about 19 19 or 20 years old and um, got married. I was the first kid. I'm the oldest of, of three. I think uh, being born without any older siblings gives you an advantage. I think it's, it, you know, it's a, an early advantage. It can be a limiting factor later on in terms of not getting access, immediate access to someone else uh, is experiences that you can learn from. But 
on the flip side of it, it's, it's everything is you enter into every situation without preconceived uh, expectations or biases. And so I think either being a many years difference from a sibling um, or being the first sibling or being the only sibling is something which is um, pretty important in, in, in like developing your risk tolerance and developing your confidence early on and willingness to see that there's no real consequences to failure at, at within most of the spectrum of failure. Um, and it, it, it just gives you, I think, such a, such a, it gave me such a head start because I, 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 I really believe that a growth mindset is something instead of a fixed mindset that when you instill into a human being early on, you set that person up for success, regardless of the traits or the features that may have been imprinted into them or any, you know, genetic predispositions or phenotypes to act or behavior in a certain way. And so fast forward, I think my, my, most of the, um, the way that I learned to think in life happened actually a little bit later on when I was um, just about to enter into high school. My mom went into um, kind of like the parent teacher uh, conferences and, and events going into high school and, and checked out all the different events and clubs and um, I remember what she was one of them she was sitting in, um, she told me about was the debate club. And she asked the asked the debate coach at that time, what type of a kid is excels at debate. And it's not what you would think necessarily, or the, at least the answer that he gave was very different than what most parents expected and probably was one of the things outside of my control that changed the trajectory of my life more than anything else. He said, it's usually not the kids that are have the highest uh, intelligence or acuity. Um, and it's not the kids that usually have the best grades, but it's the kids that are super curious, but seek out information in the world on their own and usually get quite bored um, with one way education, like sitting and receiving information in the form of lecture in the form of classrooms and kind of goof off and, uh, you know, find other ways to stimulate themselves and will force themselves to learn the things the night before a test, because that shows like, you can do it yourself. It's autodidactic. It's, um, you know, but still like a motivation and drive to do well, but on your own terms. And so, I mean, my mom just couldn't really believe that she, she heard probably the closest description to me as a kid um, in, in that room. And then of course, I wanted to play tennis. My mom wanted me to join debate. She says, look, try it, try a debate, try a debate tournament. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. I went to my first tournament and man, I was hooked. Like there's, there you know, I, I, I quickly became obsessed. Um, I, I, I poured everything into it and, and did my coursework on the weekends in the evening. And that's pretty intensive, right? Like as a 12 or 13 year old kid, spending every weekend or every other weekend, leaving your home with a debate coach for initially for the first six months in state tournaments and then national tournaments starting as early as your first year. I mean, I won the nationals as a freshman, right? So we, we were, we, we were traveling everywhere. Um, and and I, I got that experience of, okay, okay then this is- But, part but of I, I wanna stop story. you for a like, second. I wanna stop you for a second. What, like, so this is a very, yeah. very great moment to, to just to, 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 to pin. What was it, or can you remember what it was that, that gave you that unbelievable determination? And, you know, like what inspired you to want to completely focus all of your energy on that. What was it? Do you remember a moment? I mean, I, I remember themes, right? Like, or I can, I can point to um, inspirations, right? Like uh, I, I never liked team sports because I loved like having me winning or losing in my control um, or like w at my, at my uh, like, my, my effort and work and performance was the only limiting factor, right? Like execution failure was the only factor. Like I took it off the table that someone else would fail. And so that's, I think a very different mindset to have early on. Um, but do you maybe think, like, do you, wait, but, but just a quick question there. And this is a great, this is a good debate. Do you think that was something that you actually was, you were aware of at that time? Or do you think that it was just inherently this you preferred working alone i mean do you do you do you clearly remember saying you know what i want i want winning or losing to be 
solely up to me and I want to be able to have the control of my execution or lack thereof? Or do you think that you were just going for it and now later on in life, you're able to analyze a bit better? Yeah, absolutely. The second one. I mean, there's no way that I, I could form like self-reflective, philosophical, wise thoughts at that age. Like there's no way. I mean, this is just all looking, putting together, you know, revisionist history, looking back and trying to look at the information and fit it into a narrative about how you might maybe got somewhere. See, that's so that, sure. that, 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 that piece right there is what defines, I think, the beauty of this topic, born or made, nature, nurture, right? Because at the moment in time, you were, you were propelled through, through a reason that you can't really define only until later in life. However, you were so driven at that, at that time in that, to- in that subject that you essentially sacrificed everything else to get after it the way you have. Yeah, but I think I think I would have I think that there's any there's a number of things that could have been driven by right like if you if you distill it up to one level like debate debate was the place for me. But I'm sure anything that was if if someone stuck me with us a, a foreign exchange currencies trader when I was 12 or 13 and I saw like international markets and how micro decisions within one country can ripple out and have effects in. Um, you know, livelihoods at the population level in different countries, and there's cultural influence, and there's macroeconomic, I mean, there's probably a number of different things, right, that could have obsessed with me. I was obsessed with martial arts, with a a, a rare, and and there's only one school in the entire, now two, but one school in the entire U.S. of this rare Okinawan type of martial art that happened to be, you know, within 20, 20 or 30 minutes away of my house growing up that my parents stuck me in. And man, I was hooked. I mean, I was I was on track to go to Japan and compete in the international mixed martial arts um, competition, the sparring competitions as well, until debate took over, and then that that passion took a little bit more of a backseat. So, I, again, I mean, debate was the one that played the most role in my entrepreneurial life because it was substantive, right? Like from debate, you learn how to think. From debate, you learn about how to process complex social, political, economic, and legal issues from a young age and argue it from both sides. Like there's a lot more intellectualism to it than doing a backflip and kicking someone in the face. But I love them both equally at that stage. Like if, if that, if one was off the table and I was doing the other one, I would be the person today that probably would be talking about how this is the best way to get a, uh, it's someone into a rear naked choke. I mean, I don't know. Like it, it's, you know, it's so hard to say. I, 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 it's like, I can't help but think about it because I, I feel, I feel so much identification with you, right? Like, you know, we're talking about debate, you're talking about mar- debate and martial arts. I guess what we're talking about really is just this like un, like undeniable desire to hunt and to, to discover. And the curiosity is really the driving component and the, the common thread amongst you know, all the endeavors, right? You know, like I am at its purest form, you know, I am the same way. I obsess, I get obsessed over things. And I have, I have since I was a young kid, whether it was baseball, hockey, um, you know, like at a young age. And, 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 and I mean, I, I never got into, into the debate club, but I was really obsessive about the things that I loved. Um, even now with my kids you know we every every Saturday and Sunday we wake up in the morning specifically now in the spring summer fall and like I've got them so interested in nature and lifting up rocks and seeing what's underneath rocks and we and like for me it's like the hunt right like I I love walking around property and lifting up rocks you know literally and figuratively but like with my kids it's literally and like finding salamanders and frogs and snakes. I mean, it's just like this discovery thing, I think is, is, is most likely a common thread amongst uh, entrepreneurs. Um, all right, so keep, keep going, man. And, 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 and fear of, and taking the fear of fail, failure off the table, right? Like it, it's, it's all like variations of the same things that we know, yet they're so hard because I believe parents' instincts there's, a, there's an inherent tension in a parent in letting a kid fail or giving the kid the freedom to fail versus the, that 
instinctive drive to like share your wisdom, teach, like pass down knowledge from one generation to the next. And I think that it's a hard balance to fit, right? Because if, if you're as a parent, you imprint too hard on somebody, then you mo it's more like you tell them that this is the way that they, these are the values that they need. This is the way that you have to be. I mean, I think parenting is consistently like presenting different choices to children and then just like cooling off and like seeing what they do, not like steering them through something. And I think the most like pathological parenting drive is when children ask parents why they arrived at a decision for them. And they say, because I said, so, like they, they cite hierarchy or they, you know, pull rank essentially. It's like, come on guy, I, I, what, what do you expect's gonna happen? That, that kid, a parent does that enough because it's easy because maybe they're fatigued or they're tired or they just came home from a long day of work. I'm not blaming them, but you can't start to tell a kid that, hire, that, that, be things that that things are fixed that it's a it's a flat universe that things are the way that they are because that's how they are and so it's it's like that's why i say you have to dig into these deeper th themes because maybe you don't have to go into every single decision a parent should make in every single situation but if you if a parent knows that in general you have to have an expanding universe type of approach towards children that'll shape how you respond to a number of different events that could present themselves in a child's life so it is made but it's made because you're the, the child is made because it has the freedom to make right or, or for those like inherent born traits to be fully fleshed out and fully expressed like that that's a critical part of it i i, I agree with you wholeheartedly i i believe that parenting should not be a uh fixed experience for the child uh, the only thing that i've 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 actually forced my children to appreciate is the New York Giants because I'm a major fan and that's it. Everything else in their life has they've stumbled upon and I've held hand, but I've never, I've never, you know, and, and I can honestly say that like I didn't have the greatest upbringing. However, my parents didn't force anything on me either. And I've turned out pretty darn good in the world of, of, of exploration and career. You know, I, I did not have, I was not told I needed to be a doctor or a lawyer, blah, 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 blah. I basically, paved my path and I'm hoping to do the same for my kids. So I think that's a really, a really great thing that you bring up, you know, is uh, trying to dictate your, your, your child's uh, life path is, is, is probably, I would argue a mistake and could potentially be pulling the wool over their eyes of their inherent talent that needs to be uh, molded uh, in order to, to, to come to life. And, and you can really, I mean, you can see the path, right? Like, like asking questions and challenging instant and challenging like assumptions builds curiosity. So that's the first thing. Curio if you're curious, then you get excited. If you're excited, then you learn more quickly. Then you just learn faster than people that are not excited. Like the greatest challenge to education is apathy and, and lack of interest for sure. If you learn quickly, then you learn actively and not instead of passively, right? And so it's like these things start to stack onto each other. And if you layer on top of that, like the ability to apply things as you're learning them. So that basic level of freedom where you're not, it's not too theoretical or it's not so like abstract or it's unapplied, right? Like that translation, that applied step, even in my field of microbiome, that's so critical. Like don't go down a pipe, don't go down a pipe of this could be this, 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 and this. Like the minute that you get a read or a signal, apply it, test it, see if you get that data again in, in, the, in, in the area that you want to it. And then lastly is like, it just sets up kids to be like happy, like mental, have, have better mental health and to be higher performing adults. Like you, the threat of a deadline or an exam or a deliverable will just never get the same growth results that, that genuine interest can. It'll just never happen. So if you want to learn something, you'll naturally seek out the concepts and build the intuition that really, I think, forms the foundation of true learning. And, and that's really where it all begins, I think. So you're in the debate club, you're killing it, you're focused, and you're obviously taking education seriously. Where do you go from there? So 
one big, I mean, my, my parents were raised me comfortably. I never had to, I, I, there, you know, there was never an issue, but certainly I wasn't raised with like, I mean, the expectation was um, if you don't get your own scholarship, you're going to a state school. So it's just like, I, I think I had that selective pressure early on to say, well, I really do have to break out in something, right? I mean, I graduated top 30, 50 in my class. I don't think I was, I was top 10 or, or, or even 20 for that matter, but um, my, by my, you know, I was one of the only people ever still like one, a, a few group of students ever to go to the tournament of champions which is the the like highest level of performance that's usually reserved for only senior teams and it's only 70 teams across the whole country 72 person teams across the whole country um and i went every year after after i won the nationals my freshman year i went every year afterwards right so like i got to i got to kind of peer through the glass through the window of what was ahead of me early on anticipate lose to the best did debate against the best um like and, and and i mean come on like some of those debates when i was a sophomore and i was going up against the best team senior year like it was a it was a bloodbath right but i learned so much i started picking up style like stylistically i started picking up argument patterns i started picking up frameworks um and there's really nothing like it and actually i wish that i had a, a clearer mind, right? Because there was just so much going through my head that it was so frantic and reactive. I didn't, I wasn't like the chess player looking down at the board then. And I, and it took me a long time, well into my twenties before I started being able to see boards. I was still the chess player that was waiting for the person's next person's move. And so like, that's one big breakthrough that you have to have is where you start to see things in frameworks where you don't look at like your move and then it's my move and then it's your move and it's my move and, and you're so at the ground floor. At the same time, you don't wanna be so abstract and theoretical about things that you just miss everything that's happening because you're an absent-minded, you know, like you're just, you're floating off, off this, floating right off this earth in your own thoughts. And so striking that balance, I think is critical. You have to give like the ability, you have to be able to see the matrix but you also need to be able to play, live in the in the day to day world, um, and it's I I think I'm probably explaining it poorly, but that's uh, that that's one feature I wish I had that probably would have elevated my performance grade anyways higher on. So my se my senior year I I we you know the the tournament that I always look to is the um, Harvard Round Robin, which is they take the top six six two person teams by rank in the entire country and they make them all debate each other one on, head to head. Um, and then the winner of that tournament is, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a special moment. And I won that tournament and um, got a full ride to the, to, you know, top 20 university. And that was it. That was my, that was my ticket because now I was getting paid to go to school. So I had four years where I didn't have to worry about money. I didn't have to worry about student loans or debt. And I was actually making money from how generous my scholarship package was that I could use to, you know, whatever I want. Either I could use it to fool around or I could use it to incubate ideas, try new things, let fail fast and fail early and go from there, you know? And so the, the, the rest is to the races. I, I, I wrapped up in three years, took the fourth year to start two businesses. They both failed. Um, came out of it, took a year to, to expand my perspective and horizon. I, I, I traveled the world by myself without using planes um, and just opened everything up, incubated new ideas, figured out that life sciences and um, rapid changes of technology in sciences and applied sciences was my passion. And when it just kind of went from there, I came back and started a food science company. And then now I'm seed as the, the last of the labor of loves and that like long thorny um, journey of entrepreneurship. I mean, that's that there's so much that I would, I think we could unpack in there, but um, I, we could probably talk for, for days and weeks on, on um, why you traveled around without planes and what those other two businesses were and how it was to fail 
two times and what you learned from it and how you've applied those things. And I think we can touch on some of that stuff if you if you feel like um, there's some good insight there. I, I, I really do want to get into seed, understand what seed is, and then I, I want to dive deep into microbiome so that, the, so that my listeners really can walk away with an understanding of what it is and if there are a few things that they can do to easily, or a few easily implementable things that they can do to, um, to start paying more and closer attention to their microbiome. Absolutely. Well, I'll start with that one. So the, the microbiome is a relatively newer field in science. I mean, not new in that the bacteria have always been there, um, but newer in its, in its rate of acceleration. Like we're, we're, we're uncovering more and more about this system. And what this system is, is it's really the community of microorganisms that live inside and on top of the body. Um, and almost in every organ system, you have your human cells, and then you have microbes, um, and you have viruses, and you have uh, fungi, and you have protozoans, which are kind of like the hunters of that ecosystem. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a rich and dynamic ecology right inside you, and most of it's in your gut. Most of it's in uh, about you know five to six pounds of weight of it just in the middle, right in your colon, sitting there digesting your food, programming and training and, and, and interacting with your immune system, um, producing vitamins and micronutrients and a lot of other signaling molecules that are extremely both protect, can be protective in some instances, but also now we're seeing can accelerate uh, your rate of things like neurodegenerative diseases or uh, cardiovascular uh, outcomes and cardiac arrest. Like we're, a, the uh, atherosclerosis in that system, fatty liver disease, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you know, and that's just the, your, whether you're a responder or a non-responder to cancer. I mean, get that. If you take people and you change their microbiome, these people that did not respond to checkpoint inhibitor cancer therapy are now responders when nothing else has worked no other drug has worked before changing their gut microbiome can turn someone who does not respond to cancer therapy into a responder, right? So that just, I think, sums up everything you need to know about how intimately uh, involved in like such a broad avenue of, of developmental and biological processes that the microbiome is involved in. So it's, it's certainly kind of, and, and that's just your gut. When you talk about infants, the, the vaginal microbiome, when you talk about, uh, and the, the microbes, the microbial mixture they first get from passing through the birth canal from their mother are the, is, it's, it's how our company seed got its name. It's, it's a pro biological process called seeding where through that, through con skin to skin contact with the mother, through um, bacteria that come from breast milk. Uh, you know, this is, this is your first I, I mean, you tell me, I don't know if that's born or made, but it's somewhere, it's somewhere it, right in between, right? And, 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 and what you eat, get this, this will blow your mind. What your ancestors ate will determine your microbiome generations later. So there's a really cool lab in, at base in Stanford out of, it's Justin Sonnenberg's lab. And they did a, an experiment where they moved multiple generations of mice to a low fiber, low diversity diet, right? Like, so they didn't even give them antibiotics or anything like that. They just changed, got rid of all the fiber or the majority of the fiber in their diet. After three generations, so they had their pups and, and then they, they only did it in the grandmother, grandparents. And after three progressive generations, the microbes that are found in the grand generation, the third generation, about a third of the taxa were gone from what was found in the grandparents compared to a high fiber diet and that passing of those microbes and those nutrients downwards, the same more or less microbes were present generation down by generation. And so, I don't know, I mean, it's to, to me, that type of stuff is quite 
I, I think I think it's alarming for a lot of people in our field because we see what mostly the 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 shift to a standard American or a westernized or a, or a processed or a, fi a low fiber diet happened really, you know, after during and after World War II in the United States at least. And starting in other places, the more Western they become, the lower the roughage in the diet and the increase of processed foods that are consumed. So do you, so, so I guess what I'm I like, this is, I mean, it's a little off topic, but it's so pertinent to my lifestyle because health and wellness is, is, is a major part of my life. Um, are you, are you alluding to the idea that fiber is the sort of the, the, the delineation from what we were at one point on, on the healthier side of things, pre-processed food fiber is the, is the is the crux of that the, the 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 amount of fiber yeah but it's it, it, yes and no yes and that fiber is a great canary in the coal mine for a healthy food right if a food is fibrous there's probably a lot of other things in that food that are good it's not just fiber by itself like it's not like you can eat a a standard american diet and just take a fiber supplement and you know and just drink like like ingest like grams and grams of of i don't know metamuse like whatever it is like bulking agents whether it's soluble or insoluble and make up for all that effect but a diet that has a lot of diversity and a lot of roughage is is absolutely one of the biggest differentiators now look i don't want to be um overly generic about this like there's communities that lived at the edge of the arctic like at the inuits for example that eat 90% of their calories from seal seal fat and seal blubber. And they're, they're fine. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever modeled them out compared to like what a blue zone or centenarian diet looks like, but they don't die. Right. So the human being is very um, malleable. It's, it's, it's very flexible. It can totally adjust. But if you ask me what's optimal, you need that representation. And here's another, here's another statistic fiber or high fibers and roughage foods can also have a rescue effect from other things like a high sugar diet like if you look at um if you look at uh the hadza the hadzins it's a african tribe they eat for about half of the year super heavy fibrous and foods with a lot of roughage and then for about three to four months of the year 50 percent of all of their calories come from honey so they're just they're just like taking straight glucose and fructose for half of the year to stay like for, for caloric and energy expenditure needs. Is that just because but seasonally they're not, they're not able to harvest the, the fibrous food? That's what they have. Yeah. That's there's, there's, there's cycles, right? There's food cycles. And so, but it's it's enough. The fibrous is is and but then the other times of the year they're having over a hundred grams of fiber per day. And so you it it it's not like I think diets and, and nutrition and 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 things get so distilled down to such unhelpfully um like nuanced and specific pieces of advice. And I think that's just so wrong. Like there's so much wrong with that because. I think you actually need to go in the opposite direction. And the microbiome shows us that a diet which is abundant um, and diverse in nature is so consistently results in a broader diversity microbiome. Now, here's another trap that people trying to navigate the microbiome might find. They'll say, well, I, I, we, need to get, we need to get back to what our microbes used to be like before sanitation, hygiene, medicine. And so they actually start looking at a Hodgson microbiome and, and almost feeling like they're deficient. No, that's not true either. We, there's a lot of things that I've seen in samples that are collected from, let's say like the Venezuelan Amerindian stool samples that I wouldn't want anywhere inside my body. I mean, there's just no, there, there's no reason for me to have it as someone that spends most of my time in North American nature with fresh, fresh, clean fruits and vegetables. I'm fortunate to have access to and primarily consume those. Um, and, you know, sanitation and hygiene and like toothbrushes, right? Like you swallow a wine bottle worth of spit every single day. That's 750 milliliters of spit you swallow. And if you're a Mare Indian that you don't brush your teeth, 
you have a very strange oral microbiome, a lot of which starts to become part of your gut microbiome. And I won't just say point blank, oh yeah, well, it's more diverse, so therefore it's better. No, what role, what function are these microbes performing? What are they doing? You can't think in absolutes, it's a middle ground here. But more or less as a rule of thumb, the West, Western diet and even people in Western countries that eat a non-Western diet have incredibly sparse microbiomes. And that's a product of antibiotic usage. That's a problem perhaps of uh, exposure to dense microbial environments. That probably means that we're pretty far removed from soil microbes that we would probably be in a little bit more contact with. That doesn't mean you should take soil-based probiotics. There's a, a ton of reasons why that's a scam, but um, you know, at least you should live a little bit dirtier, right? Like let the kid fall on the ground, like drink the water from the river, like don't remove yourself from all of these things. The body is intended and primed to respond to some of these areas. I mean, again, don't go to Southeast Asia and get a gut infection because that could be really bad too, but don't be so far on the other end as well. I guess that's the take home message. Um, would you do me a favor just so I, I'm, I make sure to nail this in layman's terms, can you define microbiome? The community of microorganisms that live in and on the human body. Got it. And the reason why the microbiome is a relatively new, not discovery, but the research and data has been, re the, 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 the sort of bulk of the research and data is relatively new um, in the science arena. Why is that? Uh, well, a lot of sequence, a lot of, I mean, it, in, in the non-scientific community, people have known since, I mean, in 4,000 BC in China, they were giving stool samples transplanting stool from one person into another, right? Like this is an old, old practice. The idea that the gut holds a lot of influence um, and plays a big role in your health it, in a lot of civilizations. In 4,000 BC, they were actually taking the stool of someone and, and putting it into another person, thinking that that was going to enhance their, their ability to overcome a health disorder? I mean, I don't think it was so, it wasn't so preventive that they're doing it for all people, but it was definitely part of their medical repertoire at the time. If someone came in with a really bad infection and it looked like they weren't, they weren't going to make it, they would do a, an FA, a transplant. And, it, and it's, it's the exact same thing we're doing right now for people that have horrible gut infections. By the way, a lot of them, if they're above a certain age, go on to die and called, it's called a C. diff infection. And you can't give it antibiotics because if you give antibiotics, you kill everything and it's an e ecological problem. So what happens is it just comes back. It just goes down to smaller dosages and then actually it has a, a more of an advantage because you've killed off a lot of the other communities. So you have to give antibiotics and then transplant organisms which naturally keep its numbers low so it doesn't create those toxins. It doesn't create that infection. So it's an alternate way of thinking about regulating infection. The reason that, that you hear so much about it now is because we now, for the first time, the technologies are scalable that we can sequence these things. So we can do get generate a lot of data and we can get exactly all the genes, all the metabolites, all the proteins that are produced, the whole composition we can characterize and understand what it's doing. And all these things are, are very recent, right? Like gen, the uh, gene sequencing technologies came first. That was in about 2005 or 2006. They started running it on a very few samples. It was still very cost prohibitive. Now it's a hundred dollars a sample. So my, um, and, and I'll, I'll share something. So my son, my younger son was born with um, uh, a gene mutation and we didn't know what it was when he was born, of course. And he was fine in many regards, but his eyes were, his eyes were, were, were like slow catching up when he would turn his head. If he wanted to look at something, he would sort of like turn his head and then turn his eyes. And uh, we ended up doing a, an, an exome test on him where they tested all of his 
genes. And apparently there's, you know, there's 20,000 gene sequences and we're only aware of what 5,000 of them do. Um, but because they, they did the, the test on, on him, they also did the test on both my wife and myself. Um, to see what what's you know if there where the mutation if there was a mutation and if there was a mutation where the mutation stemmed from, and uh, thank knock on wood Dakota you know he's he's fine I mean he's got a little motor motor stuff but um, it's just so interesting to see the technology and to see how they are able to really go in and 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 flag a a, a gene and give us some insight as to what we can potentially expect. Um, you know, and tell us, you know, they, they were asking me questions like, do you want to know if you, uh, if you're prone to specific cancers? And I was like, no, I, I, I don't want to know. Um, I'd, I'd rather keep that information uh, with, with you guys. But um, I mean, I, 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 the technology is, 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 is crazy. Um, what, um, for, for the, specifically for the gut microbiome, are there things that people can do, simple things that people can do that, I mean, I'm sure it's not completely general because everybody is different, right? But are there, are there a few tools that you can give the, the listener today to sort of help work on their gut microbiome? Yeah, really simple ones. Um, first is include more roughage in your diet and increase the diversity of your diet overall instead of just only eating blueberries. Get the same amount of berries but have it be five different types of berries instead um, instead of just eating broccoli eat across the entire brassica genus right which is so broad it includes mustard greens all the way to cauliflower and brussels sprouts in in the same genus same species actually um and so Start, start there by just like the simple stuff with diversity. If you have a hard time processing roughage, then that's like a good place to know that your body doesn't already respond perfectly to this and that you might have to um, slowly phase and step it back and slowly reintroduce so that you model and sculpt your microbiome to be able to process more roughage without any, any side effects. So that's the first place I would definitely start. Real, real, all, one, one question, just because so, just so, I would love to, to just talk about this for a sec what is so when you say your body can't process it what is a good uh sort of detector that would that would point out to somebody point out the fact that somebody is not processing roughage well gas Con gas stomach distress um poor stool quality sometimes bloating. you'll even see bloating sometimes you'll even see chunks of the food itself pass through fully in stool like you just it's a low efficiency processing right like it's not bioconverted into a, per, a a perfect type three or type four bristol stool chart piece of stool like that's what you want and so if it's if you're getting gi discomfort and distress and suboptimal stool quality and variable bowel movements and in, in, intestinal transit time then you need to say, hey, let's go back to the beginning. Let's slowly build it up. One thing that I like to see in those situations is cut down your windows of consumption. So don't be like nibbling throughout the day. I mean, try to have your first meal at lunch and have a very, very early dinner and start to do all of your eating within a six hour period. So you're not stopping and starting digestion so many times per day, you know? And actually, I think that that, actually, that, that mimics more um, I, I think it's less about what we eat, but it's the way it's how we eat that drives a lot of people's discomfort um, because your base, I mean, how can you, how can you do anything else when your digest, when your gastrointestinal tract is trying to process energy that you don't need, by the way, because we have such an abundance of caloric energy in our diet around us. Most people do. So you need to, you, you, you need to go more to those like feast and famine cycles um, so that you give those micro, microbial communities a chance to relax down, change in relative abundance and, and hit stabilization. That's more like what we see, I would say, in a typical digestive cycle. Like, like humans can go very, very long time without food. And we also have a very long gastrointestinal tract, women a little bit longer than men. And so think that you can be processing food for, you know, a quite a long period of time before it comes out. And so it, it just shows you how 
wrong so much of our dietary advice was. Like I remember when I was growing up, the um, food pyramid and the the American Heart Association and uh, dietary uh, groups and even physicians would say, eat five to six very small meals throughout the like smaller portions, but spread them out throughout the day. You know, absolutely not. You don't want to wake up and the first thing you do in the morning is just start nibbling on glucose and then take a small snack right before you go to bed. Like it just, that's absolutely what you don't want to do. So small things like that, I, I think inter trying intermittent fasting, increasing the diversity of uh, different foods and roughage in your diet. Um, I can't tell you how, 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 how far ex a little bit of exercise every day goes. Like, like sitting uh, is structurally for your spine and for your alignment, the worst thing that you can do, as I, as I, which I say as I'm sitting down. Um, and not exercising every single day is that that's why I say, like, I think that we're over obsessing over this stuff, like those small changes just right there off the bat, that, that, that gets you back to neutral. Then if you have issues, we should start looking at your microbiome and optimizing it a little bit more there. And that's where it starts to become a lot more nuanced, right? Like, like sulforaphan is a potent, potent compound that's biotransformed by gut bacteria from cruciferous vegetables, mainly broccoli you want to optimize for sulforaphan production. So you can start layering things like that on. Urolithin A is a super powerful metabolite produced from things like the skin of the pomegranate plant and from some very specialist, special polyphenol precursors found in teas. If you don't have the ability to produce that, you can introduce it by taking smaller amounts of that and building it up over time so that those organisms have an advantage in your gut. If they're in very small amounts, they have an advantage and, and then you start enriching for them and then you start producing these things, right? But more or less out of the, like the, all that stuff is like expert level. I think the base level stuff is, well, first just figure out where you are. The base level stuff is just do the, the, the first three things and, and you'll see how you feel. And you'll feel phenomenal. Um, I'm obviously, uh, disclosing a bias and a conflict, but there's a lot of people that say that taking eating bacteria changed their life. You know, we, we, we developed a very broad spectrum, multi-strain, multi-species, mechanistically defined cocktail of probiotic bacteria, which, which we sell called DSO-1 today. It's the only, only one product that the whole company sells. And we're validating it in all kinds of ways after ethanol, after taking alcohol consumption on your gut barrier, after antibiotics and people with constipation and people with IBS, intestinal transit time, stool consistency, stool hydration, ease of expulsion, like you name it, right? Like we're, we're there. And it's a reason that, you know, a good percentage of people that start taking it never stop um, ever, at least, you know, at least since we've, since we've existed. And I so, think I would just like, you know, I like, think that that's stuff. I would love, I would love you to, you know, in a matter of time here, because I know we don't have a lot of time left. I, I would love for you to just talk to us about seed and tell us what it, what it is and how we can find it and, and start implementing it into, into our lives. Well, you can find it on, there's only one place to find it. It's very easy to remember it's seed.com. And it is, um, a labor of love that was, you know, there's not, I think I, it, it, it's kind of, um, it's so, it's so scientific. It's kind of boring where early on, we just saw that my co-founder Ara and I, we, we saw this field, you know, Ara got introduced to the microbiome because she was giving, she was having her first child and, uh, no one was giving advice. We knew that there's this whole system of childbirth that like, to your point, can make how you're born. <laughs> um, and no one was talking about it. You know, no one was giving actionable advice. No one had information. No one was helping us consider it. It's incredibly important. We now know that these windows of development, as they're called for infants and in the, from the, from the moment of birth to the first two years of life are so important. And she can share her own story on, you know, um, uh, you know, how, sh how, how th this was a, a several attempts of having children and, and th th getting to this point where both th 
thinking about this child, but not being able to produce enough milk and breastfeed creates a very interesting psychological dimension that dynamic for a mother where you know that this is something that's really good for a child, but you can't do it as much. And what do you do? What, like, how do you make up for that? Or how do you supplement for it? And so when we originally got together, we were very passionate about launching and exploring our infant program first. But as we started talking more and building this company, we started pulling in more and more scientists from the entire field of microbiome to come in and, and build different research tracks within the company. And so, yes, it's, 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 it started an infant, but now it's women's health, it's skin microbiome, it's oral microbiome, it's gut microbiome, it's next generation probiotics, it's nu infant nutrition. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of different research tracks where we try to say, how do we work and partner with best in class science, scientists, usually still at their, at their academic institution and do what we do best, which is take those breakthroughs or those, those discoveries and, and really validate them through a massive, like fermentation, scale up, optimization, stable, stabilizing those bacteria and those microbes. So a lot of technical uh, steps along the way validating them. We, we go through tons of different characterization in vitro ex vivo models, also usually partnering with top academic labs. And then we put them through human trials and, and we put, push them up against the placebo. And we just, we, we want to generate that type of data and as many different use cases as we can and, and um, are really like transparent about like what trials we're doing, what we're exploring, what data we have on, on how we built our strain bank, um, you know, and we really see an opportunity to become um, kind of like the, the first stop in people's journey through considering the, this whole half of you that you didn't really consider before. And it's everything from how you brush your teeth to what you put on to, to the preservatives and the cosmetics that you use to, um, to what you feed your kids. Right. And, and, and how you think about, you know, of course we started today with this massive unmet need, which is, a lot of people, statistically six, two out of three adults in the US have some type of GI issue, which is not addressed by diet, lifestyle or drugs today. Like that's a crazy amount of people that are sitting in this purgatory of not feeling well or not having optimal digestion, but not knowing why um, or not being able to change it. And look, I'll be the first to admit that a lot of these, these really are human behavior. And that's why I started with, you know, my co-founder RS always says something really interesting, which is like, like there's people that'll leave their heart, heart doctor or after having a cardiac arrest and go to McDonald's, right? So like, so, so much of this stuff is human behavior, human nature, but if you can't change that, or if you try to change that and it still doesn't work, what are the other levers that we have? There's diet, there's lifestyle, there's a cessation of things that are bad for you, like eating and drinking sugar and lack a sedentary lifestyle and then there's drugs like but that's it more or less that's all the tools we have today to try to fix these things we really see a future where microbes and the application of them can dramatically change the way that we think about all of these different areas how we raise kids what we eat how we um how we what the, 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 the medical procedures that we elect to take, the drugs that we elect to take, even when things break down and things like cancer, whether you can change your ability to respond or not respond based off of your microbiome, like we're just scratching the surface and most of this stuff, we're not even there yet. I mean, you know, we, we have research divisions on things like the gut brain access here, but you, you might see that marketed a lot in probiotics today, but typically what they did is they did a mouse study or they took like really stressed out college kids and they gave them some probiotics and, you know, they said they felt better. And so all of a sudden they say that this is your gut brain axis. Like, no guys, everyone just needs to cool off. None of this stuff is like, there's so much hype. What's really the gut brain axis is when there's, there's groups now as of like last month that can take a sample of your stool and predict with greater than 95% accuracy, whether you have major depressive disorder or not. That's amazing. That's crazy. I mean, that's, that's amazing now that you can just look at your gut and these other markers and start to see how people with defined conditions cluster and the role that this ecosystem can play in that. And then once you characterize it, then you can start figuring out how to, what's a probiotic or how to fix that. But until you're there, 
it's you, everyone needs to cool off on the hype because we're not there yet. It's, it's overselling the microbiome. It's overselling where we are today. We're not there yet, but the potential is there, right? Like when you say something like that, or like when you say that a different microbiome will give you, make you your cancer treatment effective or a different microbiome will, can get rid of your depression. Or so how can, but how can, can, how can seed, how can seed, like, what is it? Cause I, you know, so I know that, that, that it's, 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 it's probiotics presented in a capsule form that you offer through seed. Are you saying that if people begin to implement this into their lives, there's an opportunity, opportunity for them to not only fight uh, some sort of, you know, some GI issues, but also change their microbiome. Um, but, but yes to changing the microbiome in terms of the metabolites that are produced a hard no to all of the other stuff I talked about. I mean, who know or, or a hard, like no one knows to all the other stuff, right? Because we haven't tested it. So, so no, I, we, it, it would be a huge overrepresentation to say yes to any of those other areas. What we have, what we do have data on are things like improving digest, digestion in the gastrointestinal tract, intestinal transit time, stool quality, expo, like ease of expulsion. And that, and that is all stuff that, that, that can, can be affected by taking, by taking seed on a regular basis every day. A hundred percent. Is there a, is there a, is there a time during the day that you suggest taking it? Empty stomach with food, empty stomach at least 10 minutes before eating some food or empty stomach at the end of the night before sleep. Those are the two most optimal times, but you do want to try to introduce it as much as possible on an empty stomach. Now on an, on an empty stomach, you also can are more sensitive. So if you have any like taking the compliance part is more important than exactly what type time of day, but to optimize it, you would want to be able to get to a point where you can try to take it on an empty stomach. So intermittent fasters could take it first thing in the morning, for instance. Absolutely. Yeah. This has been an unbelievable combo, man. I mean, there is so much info here that I think people are going to appreciate. The things that I would say to take away um, that I believe are, are tools for all of us to have forever is A, Check out Seed because it's it's the, some of the most cutting edge technology in the microbiome. B, think about introducing intermittent fasting uh, into your lifestyle, um, giving your body an opportunity to not be in a digestive state all the time. C, start fucking exercising because <laughs> that that's something that 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 we don't uh, we don't do. And D think about adding more roughage to your, to your, to your protocol, your, your, your diet um, regimen so that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're diversifying your, your, uh, your microbiome. Is that, is that right? I, I think that sums it up. I mean, you can go down a rabbit hole and learn as much or as little of this stuff as you want, but um, to kind of close the conversation and bring it back full circle, like, don't see this as something which is like too clinical or too prescriptive or like another thing that you have to keep up with and really try to cultivate the curiosity for this. I mean, 50% of you by cell count is not human cells. Like go, go read Ed Young's book, right? On the microbiome, like just start getting into the rabbit hole of like what this community of trillions of organisms really are, how they got there, the evolution of it, the fact that like it challenges what it means to be humans. Like start there, like cultivate a curiosity for it. And it'll take you to some really interesting places. Raja, you're the man. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing your story with us. Um, I have to ask the last question before we close this thing out. Do you think you were born or made? Hard made. Hard made. All right. You're the best. I appreciate you. Thanks for, thanks for sharing, man. Thanks, Michael. It was a pleasure.